We've been in a series in Hebrews chapter 11, and if you brought your Bible, you might go ahead and turn there, Hebrews chapter 11. And uh, these Hebrew Christians needed to hear this message of not giving up and not growing weary because they were living in difficult times. It was a, for many of these believers, it was um, a time of living counterculturally in a couple of different ways. One is Hebrews, the uh, title of the book, it was written to Jewish Christians, and they had stepped away from Jewish tradition to follow Christ as their Savior, so they were living counter to that culture as well as to Roman culture, and it wasn't easy for them, and they needed to be challenged and encouraged and, and told not to give up, that it's going to be difficult, but don't give up, and it was easy for them to drift away from their faith in Jesus Christ, given the culture that they were living in. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 2, way back in the, in the book, it says that we must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. And this is the tendency. It's so easy to drift it's so easy to just get complacent in our Christian life because of the culture that we're in and just to gradually get distance between Christ and ourselves. They were getting tired and losing their motivation, and that's part of what this book is about, is how, for the, how they could regain uh, their discipline and follow Christ in a diligent way. They were living in some really hard times, and Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 32, it says, Remember those earlier days after you had received the light when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering. And it says you were publicly exposed to insult, persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated you sympathized with those who were in prison, joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property but you, uh, because you knew that you yourselves had a better and lasting possession. So these were hard and difficult times, and they needed to be challenged. They needed to be encouraged to stay strong in their faith. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says that they were to strengthen their feeble arms and their weak knees. They were drifting. They were being tempted to, to walk away from God. And so the author of Hebrews says, be strong. You can do this. You can finish this race. Be strong in the Lord. So it would require discipline. It would require diligence to live this countercultural life. And yet it's so easy for us. Isn't it just to ease up, just to kind of hit... Uh, you know, the pause button on life and just to hope that, you know, our life is going to take a certain course and go in the right direction, but it takes intentionality. It takes purpose for that to happen, not to get distracted, not to lose ground. And that's the context for our text today. So if you brought your Bible, read with me from Hebrews chapter 12, and let's look at the first three verses. So this is the very end of our series uh, on faith. It's our 12th week, and we're going to finish with Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And how easy it is for us to drift. This morning as I pulled up to Emmanuel, uh, here in our lawn that was freshly mowed yesterday, green grass, it looked beautiful. And I pulled up and was walking up to the front door, 
and I found this golf ball in the lawn. And uh, it's a Callaway 3, and I just thought, well, that's unusual, a golf ball. And then I thought, oh, well, City Park 9 golf course is like just across Mulberry. And I'm thinking, that's like one of my golf shots. It's like a quarter of a mile over here, and it lands in our, I'm not sure how it got here, so I'm just assuming that somebody had a really bad shot. Life can be a little bit, I play golf with Ed Hermson over here. He's kind of nodding his head like, I, I know that. I know this illustration all too well. We drift. We get off course like, this is where I want to go. This is where I want to be. But why am I not living this way? Why is it so difficult? Because the natural way of life is that we tend to drift and get off course. And it takes this intentionality. So I said we've been thinking about this life of faith all summer. Because what we tend to do is we say, okay, for me to live this purposeful life, I've got to try harder, I've got to work harder. And the whole series is about the righteous shall live by faith. It's about our faith in Jesus Christ that that keeps us on course. It's not about more human effort. It's about our trust and our faith in Jesus Christ. It's never been about works, and that's what Hebrews is about. These Jewish Christians who grew up with the tradition of Judaism and were accustomed to following the Mosaic law and living according to the rules. And it says, no, there's a better way. Christ is our mediator. There's a better sacrifice. Christ is our sacrifice. It's all about faith. In fact, the scripture says, and it goes way back into the Old Testament, Habakkuk, a prophet, said, the righteous will live by what? The righteous will live by what? Faith. And that goes back to Abraham, the founder of our faith. And we talked about this in Hebrews chapter 11. That the righteous will live by faith. It never has been by works, never. And so even these Jewish Christians now who are putting their faith in Christ, there's a reminder that it's always been by faith, never by works that we have a relationship with God. It's a little bit like, you know, when I was maybe six years old, uh, we moved into a, a new home in Oklahoma City. And uh, we made this big purchase as a family, and so, you know, we moved into this house, and not once did my father, in this transition into our home, just a normal average home, not once did my father say, son, I'm going to need some help. Uh, I need you to go to your piggy bank and pull out, you know, the $5 that you've accumulated, because it wouldn't matter. The amount of the home is way too great. My little amount would not make any difference. The Father takes care of that. The Father provides for us to get into the home. It's all him, none of me. That's the way it is to come to Christ. The Father makes provision. We just accept the gift. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith. There's our word. It's not of works. It's not of effort because then you would be able to boast about that, but it's pure, pure grace. So we start this Christian life, this this race that we're in, we start it by faith, and then we continue it by faith. It's not by effort. Galatians 3.3 says that we have this tendency to go back to human effort, even though we start by faith. It says, after starting your new lives in the Spirit, Why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? It's like we get into the house that's made provision, that has been provided for us, but then somehow we think we've got to make those payments in the Christian life. It's all paid. Christ paid it all. And so there is no human effort to achieve this relationship with God. It's all by faith. That's what we've been talking about these last 11 weeks. So faith is the key to starting our life with God. It's the key to maintaining a walk with God. And it's the key to getting us home to be with God in eternity. It's the best decision you can ever make. And there there may be somebody here this morning, you've never made that decision by faith. 
It's somehow more about you, what your activity is, your church attendance, your whatever. It's by faith that Jesus Christ has paid the penalty on the cross for you and for me. And we receive that. And if you haven't done that today, let that this be your day to receive that by faith. So this is the context to the series of Hebrews chapter 11. And it goes back to, before we take a look at Hebrews chapter 12, what we just read, Hebrews chapter 10. This is their tendency. It says in verses 38 and following, 38 and 39, it says the righteous one. Here it is again. We see this phrase three times in the New Testament. The righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. And this is key. This is absolutely key. It's the doctrine of eternal security. It's those who have put their faith in Christ that there is the assurance of our salvation, that you cannot lose that. And it says, verse 39, we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but we are those who believe and are saved. And so we run this race, and we will finish by faith. And now here's how we run the race. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Number one is that you run the race by faith when you look behind you and see many others who have done just the same. And so we're saying here in Hebrews chapter 12, it begins, Therefore, since... Since we have a great cloud of witnesses. And so what the author of Hebrews is saying is that there are 20 different examples approximately that we've been looking at. Take a look. Look back since these cloud of witnesses surround you, and it's a motivation. It helps us to see other people have done this. And he gives us example after example after example of those who have run this race. Some of those are incredibly dramatic, like Noah. No rain. Build a boat. I'm going to save you and your family. The world will be destroyed. Very dramatic. And then there are some that are not so dramatic. Enoch, who walked with God, escaped death, and went to be with the Father in heaven. It's our story, how we live by faith. All of these examples, a cloud of witnesses, these who were true to their faith to the end, they made it to the end. They did not shrink back, even if it meant death. This word witness, the root of that is our word martyr. So even though that some of them died for their faith, they made it to the end by faith. Now, what does the word witness mean? Okay, the root word of that is martyr, but, but are these cloud of witnesses, are they watching you? from heaven, and they're saying, John, you can do this, and they're watching from heaven while you race, or are they telling something? What does the word witness mean? It can mean both things, right? We witness something by what we see, so are they witnesses in what they see, or are they witnesses by what they tell? Like when you are a witness to something, you speak of something, and it really, in this context, seems to be the latter. So what these witnesses are saying, it's not that they're like in a stadium watching us run the race. Rather, they are by their testimony and how they live their life, they are speaking to us and saying, you can do this. So for example, it would be as if Moses is saying to us through his example, I left everything behind, I approached the Pharaoh, I was bold in my faith. I saw God work. You can do this too. Or it's David who says, I faced a giant, and by faith I conquered this giant. Or it's David who says, I committed adultery. I walked away from God. I even murdered somebody. But in the end, I came back to God, and you can finish this race too. Or maybe it's Abraham who lied on two different occasions and yet finished the race strong. Or it's Samson who in his life dealt with lust but finished by faith and finished strong. 
Or maybe it's Gideon that we looked at last week, 450 to 1 odds against an army. And all of these people are saying, look, whatever you are facing, whatever you've experienced, whatever hardship you've been in, you can do it by faith. That's what this is saying. They are witnessing by their story, by their life, just as people in your life do. I had a coach in high school who is that testimony for me as a young person that you can live this life by faith in this culture. And we are to be that person. We are to be those that, that are this kind of witness so that others can look back on us and say that they've done it. I can do it too. So we look back in this race. That's how we live our race. It's a life of faith that looks behind us. Therefore, since we have this cloud of witnesses, you can do this. Here's the second way that we run this life, that we run this life by faith. A life of faith looks not only behind us but in front of us. It says in verse 1, the second half of verse 1, that there is a race that's marked out for us. Uh, in the English Standard Version, it's a race that is set before us. It's in front of us. So Paul uses this idea elsewhere where he says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13, forget what is behind and for some of you, it might be your achievements, it might be those good things, or it might be those things that you regret. Forget those things that lie behind and do what? Strain toward what is ahead. That word uh, strain toward, is, it means stretching yourself forward is the, is the idea across the finish line. This is important because the race is in front of us. You cannot be in neutral you can't go back. You can't look backwards. You can't be in neutral. As we saw in the video, you stay neutral. Life just kind of keeps moving. If you're not moving towards God, you're moving away from him. The race is in front of us. This, is, uh, this word race in the Greek is the word agon, A-G-O-N. It's the word that we get in the English language, agony. And that's reality. It's just our reality. That this race is agonizing, it's difficult, it's a struggle, it's a battle. The word can also mean a wrestling match. That's life. That's the race. So when he says, take the race that is in front of you, it's difficult, it's hard, it's a battle, it's a struggle. It can even mean in, in verse 4, the context in verse 4, when it says, in your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding blood, it was explained uh, that it could possibly even refer to the pentathlon, the Olympics. So the, the pinnacle event of the Olympics where there was running and jumping and javelin and boxing, and it closed with a wrestling or a boxing match where the opponent would use leather gloves to protect their hands, but it would disfigure the face of their opponent. This is the race. It's agonizing. It's hard. It's not easy. And it's important for us to realize that in the beginning because perspective is everything. Perspective is everything. Because if you are in the race and you're saying, why is it so hard? Why is this temptation so difficult? Why do I struggle with this the way I do? Why are these people opposing me? Because that's the race. That is the race. It doesn't mean that there are not joyful times and happy times and wonderful times. Of course. But this is the race that we face. It's an agony. It's a battle. I mean, you know this from just exercising. Right? You go into, um, you, you walk or you run or you lift or whatever, and there's this resistance that we face. I, uh, you know, I, I remember in high school, um, we, I think it was on Fridays uh, for, for during basketball season, we had to time the mile uh, once a week. And I absolutely hated timing the mile. Just hated it. Uh, I felt like I've got to run a certain time, and I've got to beat certain people, and I've got to, and I just I dreaded it, and I would run this race, and it was agonizing. 
or just even now when I run and work out, you know, I go to a fitness center now and and uh, so I'll jump on the treadmill or I'll jump on the elliptical. The other day I'm on the elliptical and just working through it and there's this resistance. It's like, ah, this is just painful. And then I go to the rowing machine and I'm rowing, you know, through the, I'm, I'm on this machine and rowing. It's just painful. And then what makes it worse is I look out the window and there's five guys, burgers and fries, right there in front of me. And I think, why can't life just be about burgers and fries and chocolate milkshakes and just enjoy these things? So I get off of the rowing machine and I walk across the parking lot and I go get a burger. <laughs> no, I didn't do that. Because life, this is life. This is how we grow. There's resistance. There's hard, it's hard. It's difficult because this is how we move forward. You don't move forward without it. So this is what this is about. We get into the race, and this is, it needs to be our perspective. And he says we run, we can run with perseverance. The word is, in the Greek, translated to English as hyperstand. It's like you don't just get by, you don't just survive, you can actually thrive. Is it painful? Yes. Is it hard? Yes. But I don't cry when I'm on the elliptical or weep when I'm on the rowing machine. It's like there's something about this that I can do this. I can do this. It's painful, but it's not depressing. And neither does your stuff have to be. I got an email this past week. And uh, we had company come up. I'm telling you, I've gotten two emails within about the last couple of months that have been difficult and right before company would come over. And I got this one right before company came over. And then they got an email, and it was just ugly and nasty and not true and statements that were made that were just false. And I thought, oh, this person just, it's coming from a place of hurt and woundedness, and I get that. And this is not an attack. In fact, this is a spiritual battle because none of this is based in reality. It's a spiritual battle. And so I keep perspective and say, God, this is part of it. This is part of the race. So it doesn't have to be depressing. It's got, you got to work through it, but it doesn't have to be depressing. But this is life. So we just don't get surprised by these things. And how do we do it? When we run forward, if it's in front of us, he gives us two ways to do this. He says, first of all, in chapter 12, verse 1, throw off everything that hinders. Throw off everything that hinders. And then secondly, throw off the sin that so easily entangles. And it's both of those. So we get the first one, right? The sin that easily entangles. You, everybody here, maybe you know what that is right now. What is the sin that so easily entangles? You know it's wrong. You know it's something that you should not be doing, but you continue to go back to it. Throw that off. And we do it every day. We throw that off. That's pretty obvious for us. If I'm going to run the race, I've got to get that off of me. It entangles me. I throw it off. But the other one is I throw off that which hinders me. It's a weight that burdens me down that may not be sin at all. It's just not helping me in my growth. One way this was explained was that the minimum question to ask is, is this wrong? Is this sinful? That's a good question. If it is, throw it off. But there's another question that's bigger and more helpful in your walk with God, in your race with God, in your run, and that is those things that are gray, those things that are neutral, but they're not helping you run. It's extra baggage. It's extra weight. So the time that I'm spending on my computer, that may be something I need to throw off. The time I sit in front of that TV screen, that may be something I need to throw off. For me, this is what it is for me. It's this negative, worst-case scenario, what will happen if this happens 
kind of thinking. That God is revealing to me, Brad, you are way too negative. I'm never that way with you. But in my own personal life, I can go to the worst possible place of what's going to happen if this car breaks down? What's going to happen if this happens? What's going to happen if that doesn't work out? And I live in this. Does anybody do this or am I the only one? Some of you are saying, Brad, you need therapy. I, I just, I need the Lord. I need to throw it off. And I may need therapy. And that's okay too. But listen, I got to throw that off. So yesterday, for two hours, I heard this as a challenge from another pastor to take a half a day or a day, and I decided to take two hours, and I'm going to challenge you to do the same. I took my Bible, I took my notebook, I got away, and I made a list, and I said, here's what I need to throw off, made a list. Here's what I need to put on, made a list. And then I made a list of some other things that were kind of miscellaneous, and there are about 15 of these things. Because I want to know what the plan is for me to run successfully. And until I write those things down, I really don't know. I'm just drifting. I'm just assuming that I'm running well or I'm going to grow. So I want to challenge you this fall, let's say by Labor Day, in the next two weeks, I want to challenge you to take an hour or two minimum to take your Bible, a notebook, a pencil, and write down, here's how I'm going to throw things off this fall so I can run more effectively. What will that be for you? God's showing me what that is for me, to throw it off because of the race that's before me. So we look behind us. We see these amazing cloud of witnesses from the Bible, from our own life, we look ahead of us and see this difficult race. It's not impossible. It's hard. It's not depressing, but we must be focused and intentional. And then the last thing we see here is that this life of faith looks above us, behind us, in front of us, and above us, because look what it says in 12, verses 2 and 3. Fix your eyes on Jesus Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. He's the one who started it. He gave you the faith to believe in the first place. He perfects that faith along the way. And here's, here's what it says about Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of God. Consider, think about this. Him who endured such opposition from sinful man so that you won't grow weary and lose heart. So you think about it, Hebrew Christians. Think about it, Emmanuel. Think about this, Brad, that you look to Christ. I mean, it's great to think about these people behind you, gain strength from that. It's, it, you look at the race ahead of you. But this is where the real fuel uh, just gives you the power to overcome. How does that work? Galatians 2.20. Think about this as we close here in just a moment. Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified. I've been crucified with Christ. Meaning that just as Christ died, I have died to an old way of life. And now I no longer live. I don't live for myself, but I live for something else, someone else. And now it's Christ that lives in me. So the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So when we look to Christ, when we look to Jesus, this author and perfecter of our faith, what is happening here? One is that we see a radical love. I look to Christ and I say, this is amazing love, and it motivates me. Because it's a love relationship. This one has his very best in store for me. Love is a powerful thing. I remember in middle school, basketball, and, and you know, you, as, as a younger guy in school, they have their games in the afternoon. So it might have been 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We were playing whoever, it doesn't matter, and I look up and there's my dad. He's an executive. He's important. He's got meetings. But I look up and there's my dad. 
It's a motivator. And so this is the way it is. When we look to Christ, it's like he loves me. He cares for me. I can do this. When we also, when we look to Christ, we see supernatural strength. We experience a supernatural strength. It's Christ in Galatians 2. Christ lives in me. It's not me that does this. In 2 Timothy 2.1, it says to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. It's not like, ah, I'm going to be more determined than ever. I'm going to get up earlier. I'm going to do these things. It's not that. It's in the grace. It's God, give me the strength, and I will follow you in that strength. It's a whole new way of living. It's Christ in me that accomplishes these things. Jesus, or the, the scripture says that his commands are not burdensome. And then finally, when we look to Christ, we see a beautiful example, a beautiful example of what Christ did for us. He suffered. And we see that example. And how did he suffer? It says, who for the joy set before him. What's the joy that is set before him? where he would be willing to suffer. What is that joy? It's you. You were the joy. As he was going to the cross, he was, you were on his mind. What an incredible example. So what is that for us? When I look to Christ and I see his suffering, what is the joy set before me? It's him. That's my joy set before me. That's the joy that I look for, that there will be a day when this race is over and I look to Christ and the one prayer that we have, people, is that, Lord, look upon me and just say this, well done, good and faithful servant. That's all that matters. I want to finish well. And we are not of those who shrink back. We will, by faith, make it home, make it to the end. So let's run. And let's run hard this fall. Let's throw stuff off that is just entangling us and get rid of it. Even if it was yesterday that you got tangled up in it, today is a new day. His mercies are new. Throw it off with a new gaze on Christ fixed on him. Let's pray. Father, this is our calling. It's to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. It's to not grow weary and lose heart. Lord, I I wonder if there are those who are weary here today, and they've lost heart, and they feel as though they're drifting away from Christ. They're distracted, as we saw in the video, maybe in neutral, but they're drifting. And it might just be a little drift or it might be a drift that's a long way away. And today is the day, as it says in the scripture, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Don't harden your heart to Christ. He calls out in mercy and grace and he just says, come back, run, run to me. And he's there. So that's called repentance in the Bible. Have you received him by faith in the first place? He's the author of faith. If he's giving you faith this morning where you can say, Lord, I believe, I believe in Christ, his death and his resurrection. If you've never committed your life to Christ, do that today. And just tell him, Lord, I believe and I put my faith in you. And that's what makes me right with you. And then for those who have just drifted away, Maybe not even intentionally, but you feel very distant. Would you come back, come back to him this morning and give yourself to him, run back to him? And then would you make a commitment to him this morning and just say, Lord, I'm going to take this challenge. In the next couple of weeks, I'm going to sit down with you and I'm going to map out my running schedule. And this is how I'm going to run for you so that I don't get distracted in the busyness of fall and school and work. 
then I'm going to map it out. And by grace, by grace, I'm going to do these things. Would you commit yourself to that this morning? Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Thank you that you demonstrated mercy and sacrifice. And now we live the same way, mercy towards others and sacrifice in the way we live our lives to be faithful to you. Thank you that you accomplished this through us. In Jesus' name, amen.